Okay. Okay, hello everyone, welcome to tonight's episode. The title of tonight's episode is A Vision That Flew Beyond Thought. And so I want to speak about a unique idea, an idea which I personally have put a lot of time in um, kind of exploring, but... I find that um, there's going to come a moment, um, let's say in the in a span of 100 to 200 years, where a new sort of archetype will enter man's mind. Human beings are under the impression that they're either controlling reality or reality is controlling them. It's going to come a time where we're going to pilot our minds beyond objective and subjective limits. There will come a moment like that in our history. Now, when that moment comes, I don't know if the evolution of language has transferred to a point where people are experienced, like the pure experiencer is found and no longer language is needed for understanding. We have reached the sort of intuitive, instantaneous way of being on the planet. I... Notice that in history, and when you look at many philosophies of many people around the world, you notice that their philosophies came from what they did. You ask the blacksmith, what god do you believe in? And the blacksmith said, how dare you disrespect Thor? You know, and so it was as if the different actions that people did gave them an identity with the whole cosmic movement. It means it doesn't matter if someone someone starts dancing like the robot, <laughs> starts dancing the robot, or like <clears throat> someone sits still and just is like a military stance. Regardless, it's as if the, the, there is a sort of activity occurring, and this acti activity leads to self-generation and self-identification. So the thing is, man has been given free will in a universe where the will is unknown. So we have to kind of look at uh, the development and the evolution of metaphysics starting from first, nothing and something. The idea of the pilots is fully, the full idea is the pilots of consciousness. Pretty much I saw just like how that blacksmith saw he was in some sense... Uh, kind of like um, he saw himself in the light of Thor, a sort of mythology, I noticed the archetype of the pilot. The archetype of the pilot is the best metaphor for any sort of human navigation, right? So what I mean by that is um, we had people, I noticed something that was wrong and I laughed when I figured it out. I found out why meta, uh, sp um, traditional spirituality was frowned upon. And it was because it still had a story. Ever since my existence, I have been piloting my conscious waking state. I've had certain privileges of piloting, consciously piloting uh, my dream states, but not many, just few experiences. And I've had, I've had, how can I tell you? It's like my relationship with the self has shifted. At first, the self was in the unconscious mind, or at most in the subconscious. That means uh, the child's response to the world is reactive. What does that mean? It's like, it's like it, it's getting startled and just quickly doing something. I find it takes about, let's just give it a number, 25 years to um, become fully grounded in one's nature. Now that's a kind of bold statement, but I'm 
I'm trying to say that we um, before we we just had to move our bodies. Now we have reached the point of uh, evolutionary atmosphere of mind. Pretty much, we can't ignore imagination anymore. It is it is part of our reality. Without imagination, we won't know what's real. Without reality, we would have no relationship with imagination. The relationship we have with imagination is designs that we are aware of that are visible to the personal dimension of the person, but are not visible in the impersonal dimension of the person. Right now, as I'm speaking, what I'm doing is I'm taking my um, 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 designs from my inner reality and bringing them into my impersonal dimension. So I am in some sense communicating with my unconscious in the sense that Carl Jung spoke about a personal unconscious and a collective unconscious. With me giving these talks, technically my conscious mind is performing in front of the unconscious. And the unconscious means that everything, every person on this planet doesn't know is the same. It's strange, but we are united in our temporality, in our emptiness. I chose this picture simply because I find there will come a time where we have to wonder about the psychology of a pilot in such a vehicle. I feel our species is evolving its archetypes in accordance to its environment changing. So think about it this way. A person goes into a room, the room is a certain condition, and so they, their personality becomes animated in accordance to how they respond as who they are to where they are. It may be a new concept, but um, like I feel I exist to say it. We have to pilot our consciousness as fields of intelligence soon. What that means is individual life will suddenly be gained a new value and people will notice how every day happens once. When every day happens once, it's like kind of that feeling that it's like, how can I tell you? It's as if you got... The self that you are every day, you know, you, the self of that day you get once to experience. So sometimes when I sleep at the end of the day, even though the day was rough, even though there was, uh, in some sense, the pressures of kind of failure, inefficiency, uh, miscommunication and whatnot. We, when I slept, it's like when I sleep, I, it's kind of like a grateful sleep. I don't know why, but every day when I kind of about, I'm about to fall asleep, I'm like, okay, I lived and saw this day. <laughs> it doesn't matter if the day was messed up or not, but I lived and I saw this day. And when I close my eyes at night, it's as if there is a resolution in the sense that <clears throat> I experience existence, right? So the thing was, um, uh, a lot of my, here's the thing, here's what happens. I've, I've, um, Isaac Asimov has this quote where he says, violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. Now, Mr. Within wants to say, wisdom is the last refuge of the ego. So what that means is, if you notice, the individual consciousness requires to separate. So what does that mean? That means when, when two people are in a room and behind their eyes, they're each different way different than each other in the sense that they their values are different i find people um uh, life draws um values are like colors that many eyes see i find that human evolution means the evolution of what is accessible to the conscious mind so in this moment right now, as I'm speaking, I, if I was to kind of pinpoint the limits of the free will, I would say, sure, the limits of the free will is where the body is existing. So a sort of local condition and then <clears throat> how far the mind can see, which is. Yeah, believe it or not, it's actually your mind is unconditional at its core, but most people don't realize it. They're under the impression that things have to be contained in such a specific way that they get caught in one viewpoint when life is meant to be a navigation and piloting through many viewpoints. What that means is there's a reason, guys, in these talks, endlessly I'm telling people be playful with language, be aware of the language threshold, be aware of your subjective realms. The reason I'm saying that is because you can get possessed by where your attention is. 
Another example is it's not just in, in, in the concept of possession doesn't just have an, an meaning in Abrahamic context. A person can get possessed by an environment. Did you know? A person can get possessed by an inner environment. This is why knowing yourself in a world of change means to be aware of how change is changing for you. How it means something for you. For me, it, it, I, I noticed at some point in my life that I was living in the simulation of the agreement of my environment. It's as if I was a child and people had said a bunch of things to me and it's like waves of, I was spoon fed ideology by the environment and that ideology was just like a, uh, like just dormant in my subconscious and anything the conscious mind was doing was indirectly being filtered. So the first thing I notice is that my emotions, are they arising when there is an image in my subjective realms or do they arise when there is no image? And that's when the emotional dimension must be studied. You know, I, I, the pilots of consciousness are creatures of attention navigating through thought, not creatures of thought having some uh, uncontrollable attention. To pilot something means that you have to become one with the plane. There's no greater, like the pilot that's navigating, just imagine a normal pilot in the sky navigating all the passengers, you know, and the stewards and the hostesses in, in, in the cabin are the advanced communicators, another kind of archetype I've projected, you know. For me, all human beings are either advanced communicators or they are pilots of consciousness. The pilot of consciousness is an unknown field moving a particular intelligence and the advanced communicator is when the particle still feels it is the intelligence. So what that means is when I notice the world is multidimensional, I just ask myself, I'm like, okay, if there's a chance, 0.00, .00 whatever amount of zeros, 1% chance that this world, there is another dimension that we cannot see. If there is just the tiniest percentage of a possibility, what would, how would the meaning of the eyes of now find meaning in the eyes of the next? Guys, this is, this is kind of, um, this may sound to a lot of people as a bit of an intimidating and scary thought, but I find that it's a universal truth. That we are not here to experience an image or a concept or an idea, we are an active experiential mover. And this experiential movement appears as a, with the observer of the objects and subjects of observance that it moves through. I feel we are a species that has just opened up to its mind and it doesn't know what it is. And just certain self-generations of the mind have convinced it that this is, this is it. There is more. I find that uh, there's two kinds of responsibility. The, uh, and the scholars of this world, even though they were um, uh, kind of prohibited from seeing the ultimate experiential sight, but let me tell you something that all the scholars in the world were ha held that was a divine glow. And it was that they wanted to be responsible for how the linguistic simulation expressed. You see, sometimes when I speak about ideas, I understood this very early on, and the ancient Greeks really helped me with this. <laughs> so I remember reading a quote from Aristotle, and he said, it's the sign of an educated mind to entertain an idea without uh, accepting it. I heard from Socrates, the only true wisdom is to know you know nothing. I heard from Heraclitus, no man steps in the same river twice. So, so in some sense, I suddenly got this impression that the next kind of phase of the evolutionary intentions of the mind is to return to its attention. <clears throat> I found it kind of hilarious that um, when I was younger, uh, of course, uh, <laughs> there, there was a time where I got distracted in class and the teacher shouted like a savage, like a savage unevolved human. <laughs> Pay attention, you know. And I was like, if I'm, if my attention's there, I'm not. Uh, there's, it's like maybe I was paying attention. You know, <laughs> I remember that experience was profound because I realized there's a restriction and discipline identifies with rational order. 
it's systematic. What that means is our civilization is machine-like because it is system-like. And in order to be a system, its values have to be static for, for it to have a certain result. So what that means is if we are all part of this civilization that is kind of machine-like and repetitive in its behavior, even though there is evolution of many technologies, but it's that it's like what's in front of the eyes of man is changing, of course, technologi tec technologically, ex there's exponential growth. But, but... How much is the user of technology evolving? How much is the seer of thought aware of the unseen? <clears throat> hey guys, uh, welcome to today's episode. Um, I just saw the chat section. Usually I make the thing full screen, um, the live video. But <laughs> Anyways, guys, what I'm trying to say is that there is a light. Imagine there's a candle in a room. I, this is the best metaphor I feel I can share at this moment. Imagine there's a candle in a room and this candle is lit. You enter the room and you light the candle. Now you see this candle is lit, but now imagine you suddenly realize you can't turn off the candle. The wax is nature. It's nature's will. It's nature's will how long my voice will stick around in this plane of existence. So the candle wax is the biological position and the light of the candle is the consciousness the human being has. Therefore, temporary human consciousness. Therefore, this is, this is the primal position. This is the chessboard that the game is happening on. These are the certain fundamental things that are there, right? So now, this candle is burning to show the world to itself. This candle realizes because its mind is a light, it's casting shadows. The shadow of the ever-present non-dual mind is a dualistic expression. That means there were some people, you'll see it here, I'll give you an example. This was something so profound that we got to all clap for the show Monty Python. In Monty Python, there was a scene where one of the guys goes to this kind of, he's looking for the Holy Grail, and uh, he goes into this castle, and it's like the most beautiful nuns are there, right? And he's getting consumed by, by a sort of infinite desire. Do you know? And last second, <laughs> his buddies come and take him out of that place, you know? And sometimes in life, there is a desire that gives an elusive promise. You have to be careful for what you want in this life because we're starting from our own sphere of knowledge and kind of like discovering the next onion-like layers of, of the unknown. <laughs> My fascination is I just saw an event. I just saw something behind my eyes, like an incident, like a scene. And that scene was, a, in some sense, there came a moment I saw that it was as if, imagine an institution calling upon all pilots. Imagine, I, I, I write a lot of science fiction, I can develop it this way in this moment. So imagine like there is, um, um, <clears throat> there is literally a person and in that room, there's a bunch of people filled in the room, and this person is kind of like, let's say, an, um, a sort of, God. I'll say it like this. There will come a time where all pilots of external vehicles will have to become responsible for piloting their inner vehicle. The inner vehicle is the idea of self, and beyond the inner vehicle, you got to be aware of the user of technology. What that means is when a person is driving, for example, it's not that they should just be aware of the road and their blind spots and just the whole environment that this kind of moving vehicle they're in. They have to also be aware of the state of the person to see if they can drive. Duration. That's piloting, by the way. This is why when the pilot lands, everybody claps. Even if, it, whenever you get on a plane, just clap. Just clap for how one person um, uh, navigated a chunk of metal. 
<clears throat> to a different place, you know. So, so anyways, what I'm trying to say is that a responsibility for attention to navigate thought consciously, um, it, same way as a pilot has to navigate the plane, which is the plane of existence in that moment. So you see, a, a pilot is on the land, okay? The pilot is in the airport chilling, you know, and then he's called to go, the flight occurs. And so he goes in and he's, he's seated on the plane and there is co-pilots there, <clears throat> you know, let's say. And so as this pilot is not realizing the plane lifts off and goes into the air, when it's in that air, the reality of all the passengers, including the pilot in the journey, are limited to the plane of existence. It's, it's that plane becomes their world and i'm saying in certain states of consciousness when one's attention navigates beyond dualistic fields and there's many ways to provoke it to that direction many traditions throughout history have had various practices of a spiritual context but the idea is that without language there would be no subjective separation of identity for there to even be an individual to have will. So what that means is we have created our individualism as creatures consciously. Or what, let's say it unconsciously even developed due to the biological position. But now requires consciousness. It's like, think about it, man. Like your ancestors, right? They, they had certain tools accessible. Now, one can say if there is a tool accessible and one doesn't use it, they are either unaware of the world they're in, of where they are, or they don't know what the tool is. And I find every human being is aware of a sort of phenomenon known as their mind, <laughs> their attention and intelligence in the moment. Now, this is a tool accessible. We have never had a civilization this advanced, even though I have to when talking about it see uh, look at its inefficiency because the efficiency it's like imagine you have a team and certain members of the team are performing well certain members of the team are not so what do you do you go and you wonder you ask questions to figure out why the inefficiency is existent so when i wonder about reality the efficiency it's like all you can do is say thumbs up good job keep going systems that are efficient you know, uh, uh, keep going. But when you look at an inefficient system, as any system becomes inefficient if it doesn't update, simply because its environment updates. It's the same with businesses. If the business model doesn't update, the, it will not adjust to the marketplace properly. This is why so many businesses die out. It's kind of savage to watch, right? Because their model is not one of adjusting to higher realities. It's one of just finding a successful reality and doing it. And that's it. And let me tell you, true success, there's some beings who don't even, cannot even conceive failure because their success is endless. Can you imagine experiencing endless success? That means it's like you don't know if the success is fully successful, so there's this endless success. I found it very unique that language... We owe, like language is, believe it or not, I, I talk about it as a cage... And I also talk about it as, as a shrine. My mind, if I were to tell you its shapes, the reason I can communicate them is because they relate. And sometimes one in the phenomenology of their experience will discover the unrelatable. Something, something, they will see something in the moment that it is too unknown for them. That unknownness makes the being calm down. And revert to a natural state. Uh, believe it or not, a, there are some teachings, sure, they're conceptual, they require the visualization of the individual to kind of give, give shape to the symbology. Think of it this way, when you read uh, words on a piece of paper, guess what? That's ink. That's ink on a piece of paper, okay? That is just ink. It is your eyes that evoke the letters that are together into a word and then evoke the word into an image and as you read the line with a certain momentum the sequence of images makes a sort of film-like projection this is why some people they might not like reading not because they're um because they're not reading fast enough because the film is not projecting when they read
There's a quote by Hafez where he says, the Sufi mystic poet from 700 years ago, this Persian poet, he says, Bring out your neck from that dark nest in which you hide. I will pour effulgence into your mind. Another way of saying it is, Once you have an ability to be comfortable with the now, you also gain an ability to be comfortable with all projections and phenomenology in the now. My evolution as a being was went go, it, it went from a biological individual person just thinking I am just the shape, you know? to come to realize that in my eyes was a designing, uh, a kind of creative potential. That creative potential was how man has not an inanimate relationship with the unknown, it's just pitch black emptiness, it's an animate relationship with the unknown. It's when the, uh, uh, the emptiness becomes a portal. It doesn't become the end, you know, because if you can't <clears throat> see the end, you can't experience it. This is why, like, <laughs> if you can't see the end, you can't experience it. Very true. I just find that it's not just computers that are advanced technology. We are advanced biological technology. Now, this biological technology has an ability to function through chaos and order. There was a poet named Rumi. He said, uh, a bird needs two wings to fly. And in other words, the mind requires chaos and order to exist. So in that, what that means is if, um, without duality, the mind cannot individualize. So do not fear chaos. Do not fear order. Just treat them as they're here. There is great order here and there's great chaos here. They're also living among us, right? It's not just people that are walking in the streets. Ideal ideologies are walking in the streets of people's minds. And sometimes those ideas uh, uh, take over the person's action. Another <clears throat> example of this from a good movie is iRobot, where Will Smith is in that kind of accident and he tells the robot to save the girl, but the robot has calculated there's a greater percentage to save Will Smith, so he saves Will Smith. And it was as if Will Smith understood that the robot was bound to his rationality. The imagination was on lockdown because reality was not allowed to be anything else. Because wonder was cut off. And everything, it's, it's like we had a, this philosopher named Michel Foucault, which um, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with some of his ideas. And he had this idea where he's like, things began, began becoming more um, institutionalized through history. Now, this institutionalizing is not a suggestion of, oh, there's a shadow in the darkness. It's a <laughs> This institutionalization is a suggestion that man has taken things more seriously. The species has began looking more closely at what it is. Now, Mr. Within is saying, as it did, as the species has done this, it has made a, a, a city of language it's living in. Okay, a city of commonality. It's as if we have to uh, look at the same thing if we dare be a collective. That's the sacrifice. That's why the animalistic instinct was a lesser pleasure. Your animalistic desires, I'm telling you, they're lesser pleasures. Greater pleasures are collectively alive. That means you think there was more joy um, from Martin. Like, do you think Martin Luther King, for example, experienced more joy when he was partying with friends? In some sense, trying to universalize an environment, trying to point the attention of human, human beings to the decency of their advanced minds. <sighs> 
Romy also has this quote, which I'm very fond of. He says, before death takes away all that is given, give away all that there is to give. What does that mean? That means we are an ener- human beings, believe it or not, we are sources of energy. This energy can be focused to change something consciously. You see, like an animal, this is what I found fascinating about man. Animals are lost to their personal dimension. They are lost. What does that mean? That means nature is moving them. But we, as human beings, are a part of nature that have noticed nature moving us and therefore stand in a greater evolutionary position. It's as if this is the difference that animals cannot have see the future of death. For example, consi- consider death. Animals cannot consider mortality. Human beings consider mortality. The reason we consider mortality is because we see more from the pic- living picture. And so I asked myself, kind of like, it's, I remember I got inspiration from Lord of the Rings. In Lord of the Rings, there was this thing where they said one ring to rule them all. And I thought, whoa, 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 civilization. What's that one story trying to rule them all? And I suddenly noticed where the religious, uh, religious ideology stood. I noticed where any ideology stood to be loyal to its design. What that means is, even though we think it is our ideas that will unite us, but it is our eyes, or the eyes of our hearts that will unite us. When the human being asks himself, all right, all right, this is, I'm, I'm on this planet once, okay? So, so it's like when I'm here, what is, what is the most efficient thing? Is it to, in some sense, uh, idolize the self? Is it to just idolize others? Is it about idolizing self-generated ideology or other-generated ideology? It's about realizing that you are alive and that doesn't mean life has a purpose. It means you get to see something and then ask the question. That's the, that's the opportunity. We see more and that is why we're evolved. Now, Mr. Within is saying, where's the edge of this site? All educational systems of the world, I'm asking you, you know, where's the, where's the edge of your site? And then, then we realize the value of language. So globalization is literally different ways, um, various people with various cultural programs generate language. Think of it this way. Um, the, the, the identity of the person is a child of the, the, what the world showed it and what it showed the world. I've had moments where I remember um, I just sat down. It was a very kind of strange vibe. I sat down in nature, like on a grass field in a park somewhere. <laughs> that's good. That's nature enough for me, you know. And uh, so as I was sitting there, I just closed my eyes for a second and just wondered after 100 years, after I've died, or whatever, after like I transition, how many years further can my mind wonder about what will happen? And when I notice that, I suddenly notice that our lives are blindfolding us from the collective life that the species deserves in its ultimate efficiency. So the priority becomes immediately activate efficient vision in your personal reality. And once you trust the personal dimensions, you will also trust the impersonal dimensions. What does that mean? That means once you know nobody has your eyes, you stop freaking out over words. You know? (laughs) That's ultimately a kind of sort of contentment that arises, I find. Life is is a journey... There, nowhere has it been kind of said that everybody has to do the same thing. The issue is that the civilization requires collective effort. Now, we don't know how to do this, but Mr. Within finds at least, it's like if we don't have the answer at this point in history, we should at least be able to pinpoint the question. You know, sometimes a question introduces a world that the answer may never see.
All right, guys, um, I don't do this often, but um, in this episode, I guess I'm going to, I have a feeling I should read like um, this kind of poem I wrote years ago. So I wrote this in 2016 in a poetry collection called Kites of Old. And... Um, Let me find it. Okay. The poem is called Modern Shamanic Temptations. I wrote it August 7th, 2016 at 3.04. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's in the mind notes, you know. Um, so here, I'll read it. It's this poem I wrote. It's Modern Shamanic Temptations. That's the title of the poem. Has a plant made you forget? You are part of this planet. Or has it reminded you that you are the universe? Many flames have guided the lost to the founder of God. There is no puzzle to solve. Just open your heart of hearts. For the chest that kept treasure made all think the outside was not to be treasured. Let love speak first. Then all of creation shall become heaven's arrow. Wow. I have no idea what this poem is. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, <clears throat> you know, this is kind of funny, but uh, what the poet is here is trying to say here, guys, <laughs> is that uh, sometimes we get so obsessed about what we want to be that we forget where we are now. And this is why in, 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 in a state of love, and love has changed meaning in, throughout history. But ultimately, it's a collective presence given freedom. Let me see. I feel like here, this is a good one. Um, this is from the same poetry collection that I wrote in 2016 called Kites of Old. So the, t the title of <clears throat> this poem is Beyond the Within. I think I personally need to reread this. One night I saw all the worlds of manifestation at once. Of course, I was using a comb, and each hair on my head had become its own universe. <laughs> Our kindness shows who we can truly be. Beyond the within, you are everything. I'm going to go one more, guys, and um, this this one's a bit longer, but um, it's called Honor That Won't Let Go, still from the same poetry collection. It says, my beloved being, are you the treasure that you are seeking? What has made conception change the face of the cocoon into a new opening? How many butterflies fly from the Caterpillar's airport. Joy is boundless and pure, just like you. The omniscience of impermanence is a completion through imperfection. In other words, there are no other words. <laughs> the glory of life is that the queen gives the beehive its meaning. Royalty was never meant to have sharp teeth. How many nobles can hear the peasants breathing? Burdenless and silently proud, the Lord of the universe bows to a grain of sand. For the hourglass only breaks when the hand lets go of fear to feel the fearless. Am I a child of God? Or is my child God? 
another way of saying is like did uh, uh, was I created or did I create the creator both are true <laughs> once galaxies collide to show multiversal patterns in the universe of a single atom we choose life only to see we live on beyond starlight who said awareness can die the honor that lets go frees all time i got a very interesting idea from that last sentence that we have to free our memories from the now how fascinating anyways guys um i felt like sharing that <laughs> honestly it's that um the evolution of the mind will require to acknowledge more sophisticated realms. Even Albert Einstein told us you can't solve a problem at the same level of consciousness that created it. So if our experience of the moment is problematic, then that means some unknown factor in the moment is probably going to need to influence. There needs to be an unknown influence, a sort of new thing that needs to happen in order for the vision to see a greater landscape. So I find that really man is not a creature of language. Okay, and that's what I mean when I say we're creatures of thought. We, we are symbology behind our eyes to ourselves. And uh, Mr. Within finds that's a sort of mask uh, on the truth. <clears throat> I found it remarkable in um, Venice, there were these masquerade parties. And I thought, how, how interesting, the face that, you know, they say the eyes are the gateway to the soul, but a person's face reveals their psychology. You know, so it's like when these people had masks, it was only like the, their eyes and just just an unknown. Do you know it was eyes plus unknown factor when they would like, you know, be in the uh, that Venetian masquerade party or whatever. So what I'm saying is it was a kind of hiding the uh, it's like when a person feels they can't be seen, they feel they're free. An example of this is a person in the shower. Why do they feel so free to sing? Is because all right, you know, <laughs> there's walls, you know, you know, and, and and so what I mean is, it's like the freedom is given when you're not seen in the wrong way. So we have to be careful that political correctness doesn't in 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 a move like a virus in many professions where the people must have freedom to be themselves to show their true art it's like kind of it's like sorry guys i gotta write something down Life is a moment. And as that moment concentrates on a singular point, it becomes to, it, the mind begins to move in the contextual, in the context. So I have a very unique relationship with ideology in the sense that I claim that if I can look at, put an object in front of me, like this marker, and I can literally walk in, literally look at this marker from different angles, I soon notice that I can look at my thoughts from different angles. And I notice that's what really history has been. The eyes of different people sh uh, sharing what, 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 as closely as to what they felt happened. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means truth is hard to find when there's many illusions still afloat. The pilots of consciousness will, it's pretty much human beings with an archetype that gives their free will freedom 
to move as as a as a rhythmic moment of being i find we are creatures that just think about it it's like There is no awakening. Every person starts off in their personal dimensions. Uh, our social conditioning, our psychology can be seen like comets that kind of like, you know, uh, meteors that hit the earth and they made a hole. And that hole is the conditioning that the child needs to continue through. Okay. Where to next? <clears throat> Man's relationship with language, just being sensitive of the subjective realm, gives him a sort of inner freedom. The inner freedom ultimately is thinking its attributes. It's filled with form and shape where it thinks it's formless and shapeless. So we have to ask ourselves, does our individual consciousness originate from a shape? And what is that shape if it is? You know, some people have this view that it's, it's rooted in the unconscious. So as one reverse engineers back into like literally you sit down and wonder about how your life has, ha has happened so far. As you kind of reverse uh, engineer back through your memories, you reach a point where you see nothing else. So what does that mean? That means the intelligence had a linear intention in the cosmos and this linear intention suddenly reached a dead end. Now, what happens at the dead end? Either you return back or in some sense, you in some sense confront the unknown. Now that confrontation with the unknown, it happens to every person in accordance to the story they're telling themselves about who they are. You know, it's as if what is really alive now? Where is the attention of the species driven to? Just think about like what kind of story the future generations will be telling themselves and what kind of seeds of actions are being planted. You know, there is the saying, we must plant trees that we will most likely not have the opportunity to sit under their shade. Buckminster Fuller says, keep inventing at some point, like the utility for what, what was invented is going to be found. So what does that mean? That means effort in the dark room. Effort in like when you want to study your inner realms, when you want to study the self, the moment, the psychological kind of conscious attention or however way you're <clears throat> dressing the self up, you know. <laughs> The pilot of consciousness, when it wants to navigate through noise and move uh, through movement and stillness, acknowledges the silence first. When it wants to navigate and move in the silence as a field of being, it must acknowledge movement and st uh, movement and noise first. Life is, believe it or not, like a moment constantly held through different accesses of meaning.
it's like just like how the planet has a sort of tilt to it you know that tilt changes throughout life and there's ways that i find sometimes a person can get even um it's like this it's like does the artist keep drawing the first artwork and keep making it bigger 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 and realizing it can endlessly make this artwork bigger or should the artist reach that the expansion of that artwork to a certain range and stop there and then move on to the next thing you know it's like should an architect endlessly try to <clears throat> make the tallest building in the world or should he move on to different things and i find that uh every every person has a, a value system and if they understand how their value system works if they understand what environments that uh, their attention went through to be sculpted as who they are then they gain freedom from what they feel they have to be so it's like first you are freeing the objective self from uh, from so the sub so you're free you free the objective realm from the subjective realm. Then you have to realize the subjective realm has to give it it give itself its own conscious freedom. <clears throat> now after that occurs, that's when I feel human beings will we will be more than personalities. We would be presences of the moment. They say a man is the room he walks in. Similarly, um, uh, the presence is the personality evoked in the moment. We have to pilot between the known and the unknown rather than just um, going into a bunker of, uh, of the known. Even Aldous Huxley says, like, there's things known and things unknown, and in between are the doors of perception. Anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Really, the idea is that um, consciousness can be piloted. And we pilot from conscious moments uh, into a greater understanding of the unconscious. And the whole point of studying the mind, even Carl Jung said, it's like unless you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your mind and you will call it fate. You will suddenly see that uh, you have not felt the presence of the moment. And so it's as if... Uh, insecurity pours out <laughs> anyways guys thanks for tuning in much blessings and namaste